stress versus cold. The way that we just went in the tub is stressful. It causes pain, it creates a hormonal panic response within our body. The cold creates that stress, and it's really we who learn to manage it by practicing. So although I'm a civil engineer and I study infrastructure resilience, what I discovered was the infrastructure can't be resilient unless the people are resilient. It isn't just the infrastructure. It's not just the concrete and the steel during the earthquake or during the tornado or during the flood. It's the human response to the stress condition. People are the source of adaptive capacity. It's people who are creative, not buildings, not bridges, not power grids. So I started to think about calming people down, about overcoming the panic response. There is one way. There is the socially evaluated cold presser test. And this, I've discovered, is a standard protocol in psychology for stressing psychology subjects, for intentionally inducing stress in the patients and then seeing how they respond. So psychologists and other doctors will do the socially evaluated cold <coughs> presser test and measure your blood pressure, measure your heart rate, measure your sweat in your fingertips. And sure enough, all of these things are going up, showing that you have an adrenal panic anxiety response to this is just putting your hand in ice water for three minutes. Turns out to be effective for creating the kind of stress that they want to observe in patients. They're not doing it to allow patients to practice a stress response. This is to create the response. This is a highly cited paper by Karen Allen. She subjected people to the socially evaluated cold presser test to see whether they were better at dealing with stress when they were accompanied by their spouses or by their pets. It was the family dog that kept the blood pressure lower, that kept the breathing rate lower, that kept the heart rate lower compared to spouses. Now, not everyone, some spouses were really good at mitigating the stress response for their loved ones, and others weren't. The support of the people around you and the practice mitigates the stress of the cold water. We have the physiological and we have the psychological. Let me start with the study that made me rethink my whole approach to stress. This study tracked 30,000 adults in the United States for eight years, and they started by asking people, how much stress have you experienced in the last year? They also asked, do you believe that stress is harmful for your health? And then they used public death records to find out who died. Okay, some bad news first. People who experienced a lot of stress in the previous year had a 43% increased risk of dying. But that was only true for the people who also believed that stress is harmful for your health. People who experienced a lot of stress but did not view stress as harmful were no more likely to die. In fact, they had the lowest risk of dying of anyone in the study, including people who had relatively little stress. Now, the researchers estimated that over the eight years they were tracking deaths, 182,000 Americans died prematurely, not from stress, but from the belief that stress is bad for you. <laughs> This is a revelation. It is not stress that is killing you. It is the story you tell yourself about the stress you're experiencing. The people who experience a great deal of stress, but don't believe that stress is harmful, they're the ones who are the healthiest. How do we get to this state where we stress ourselves, or where we're experiencing stress, and we still believe we're fine, it's healthy, yes, it's stressful, Maybe it's even unpleasant, but it is not killing me. This is Nicole Calabrese. Nicole used to work for me as an undergraduate research assistant. This is Nicole in her first bodybuilding competition, and she won. Nicole's very smart, and she's determined, and she's disciplined. This is Nicole. After her competition was over, she said, well, now I'm interested in this ice bath. She and my daughter are friends. My daughter just graduated from ASU. So my daughter says, well, come on over. We'll have a bunch of people in. 
This is her first ice bath. I call that fighting the cold. I love the smile. You know what's funny? Is your toes don't even reach the end of the tub. I think that's just kind of hilarious. So. Wow, Nicole. This holy moly, enormous improvement. I'm being manipulated. There's something called the Muse headset. I don't know if you fool around with this, but now you can buy a headset online. It's got electrodes and it wraps around your brain and it measures your brain waves. It's got a fairly crude description of your brain activity from active to neutral to calm. So what I've got over here on the left is one man who's a very experienced meditator and a woman who has some experience but she's not an expert. And we asked them to meditate for three minutes and we used the muse to measure their brain waves and you can see Pretty good. He only spends three seconds of the three minutes up in the active zone. Most of the time, he's neutral and he spends quite a bit of time, 30 seconds total, in calm. She's all over the place. She can get down to calm, but she pops up fairly quickly and she often, especially at the end, spikes up into active. Then we put them in the ice. Here's what happens when our first subject is cold and wet. And right away, he drops into the ice, and he drops into calm. There's something going on with his brain, which makes it so much easier for him to hit that calm, meditative state when he is cold and wet. And the weird thing is, he gradually rises up out of calm, exactly the opposite of what our subjective experience might report. And he spends the rest of the time in neutral, and he's barely any time at all in active. His meditative goal is to calm his brain, and it works a lot better for him in the cold water than it does on dry land. The woman is even more interesting. Same thing, she drops straight down into calm, and then she struggles back up into active. She brings herself down into calm, and she stays there. She's done several of these tests on dry land. She's never been in calm for this long. And then she pops out. And, and can hardly get back in again. So I asked her, what happened? She was doing this in my forge on my back patio. I live near the railroad tracks. She's in the, and this is the way she reported it, she's in the tub, she's calm, and the freight train went by. <laughs> and for whatever reason, the train distracted her meditation to the point where she just lost her concentration. She popped up into active, and she was struggling to get it back while the train was going. And I just think that's an interesting story. We don't have a comprehensive data set. These two are typical of what we've seen in a number of people who compare the meditation in and out of the cold. When they put people through the socially evaluated cold presser test, those people who had been habituated to calm themselves down did better. Those people whom they told, look, if you do really well, you're doing these rewards, or this incentive, they did not do that. So if we want to perform under stress, we must develop the habit of better performance. How are we going to develop the habit of better performance under stress? One way is to put yourself into high stakes, high pressure, high stress situations and perform. Another way is to put yourself into low stakes, low pressure, high stress situations and practice. So this is my new hypothesis. We put people under the cold stress, the stakes are low. You can get out of the tub if you want and there is no pressure. And we allow them to practice so that they develop the habit of calming themselves down when the stress is high stakes. Even though this is a hypothesis, famous people are now practicing this. This is Tony Robbins. He built himself a cold plunge pool. He's more famous for fire walking, but he says he does his cold plunge daily. What I think is really interesting about Tony Robbins is 57 degrees Fahrenheit. That's like barely even chilly. It's not an ice plunge. It's a chilly plunge, you know? You have to have ice for it to be ice. This is Jack Dorsey. Uh, he was recently interviewed. He talked about his habits. He says, I start every day with an ice plunge. Jack says that he goes into his ice cold tub 
and it unlocks his mind. He's not doing it for because he wants to lose weight or something. He's not doing it for exercise recovery. He's doing it for the mental benefits. Uh, this is Aubrey Marcus. Aubrey Marcus owns a gym. He wrote a book called Own the Day. Aubrey Marcus also works cold exposure into his um, fitness routine. This is Laird Hamilton. Um, Laird Hamilton is a champion surfer. You can see the ice cubes in the water. So it's become more popular among these high achieving celebrities. They are not doing it for the same reason that if you were an athlete in college, you did it after practice. They're not doing it for muscle recovery. They're doing it for the mental and emotional benefits. And we're seeing this now show up in the science and in the popular literature. This is Taleb's book, Anti-Fragile. The idea that when you stress yourself, living systems respond to stress in ways that make them stronger. Scott Carney is an investigative journalist and he studied Wim Hof, who's the guru of cold water exposure. And he took that line from Nietzsche, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. When we stress ourselves in intentional ways, non-fatal ways, because we're living systems, our bodies, our brains respond so that we can better accommodate the stress. Vim's written two books, his capacity to stay in the ice water for 45 minutes at a time, his capacity to control his own immune system, the physiological miracles that Vim Hof um, seems to exhibit, it's trained. It gives us some insight into the characteristics that we can acquire for ourselves. And Carney writes about his own journey, what he's proving in his book is that we can acquire characteristics that would seem superhuman if we didn't understand the way to train ourselves. Along the arteries are something called smooth muscle, which will contract to bring the blood into your core if you're cold. Now, if you were to plunge into ice water right now, that would squinch with so much force that the, your hands would just be incredibly cold. But you actually have to get cold and actually feel that sensation in order to activate that muscular response. The Algonquin nurtured their underlying biology by not building barriers between themselves and the environment. In childhood, they would take their infants and put their infants in the snow for 15 minutes at a time before bringing them back inside. It's the same technique that Scandinavians use to today, and Russians, and indigenous people all over the world. And what this does is build a resistance to the elements that will last your whole life. And you can also build this in adulthood as well. I want to show you one more thing, and that's Renaud's syndrome. Renaud's is both physiological and psychological. When Renaud's, the non-skeletal muscles in your veins constrict in response to cold. This is a very natural phenomenon. We all experience it when we get into the ice water. But in Renaud's, it happens for people at temperatures that could be 60 or 50 degrees. The last thing that you'd want to do is take someone with Renaud's and put them in the cold bath. I remember one year on New Year's Eve, I went to like a um, you know New Year's Eve fireworks with my family at a local like uh, farm, like mm -hmm. a little. It was maybe like 62 degrees outside, and I was layered, and I had boots and two layers of socks, and and I am having like a full on like my fingers went white within like 30 minutes mm -hmm. of being out there, mm -hmm. and they stayed that way until I got back into my home, which was an hour later. Mm -hmm. And I had to take like a warm shower and I just couldn't. And bringing them back was so fucking painful. Like it was like they were on fire. She knew it was psychological. This is not a physiological response. It's an anxiety response. And she's not sure what she's afraid of. It's just kind of a generalized anxiety. And this is a friend of mine and she knows that I'm doing uh, cold baths. And she knows she does not want to get in the cold bath. Except she has a nine-year-old daughter. Her youngest daughter has cerebral palsy. And her youngest daughter doesn't experience sensations from the waist down the same way that other people do. And I don't know how to describe it because I don't have that condition. But when her youngest daughter was over and putting her feet in the tub, she said, Mom, this feels really good. 
because she was feeling her extremities in ways that she hadn't felt them before. She said, Mom, can I go all the way in? Daughter went in. Daughter had a pleasant experience. And Mom started thinking about her Renaud's. And she said, if my nine-year-old with cerebral palsy can get all the way in the ice tub, then I can get all the way in the ice tub. This is what that looks like. I'm, I'm like out of my body and in my head. ready to get out after four minutes in 37 degree water, which she would have claimed was physically impossible for her before. She's a writer, and so she wrote a story about it. She published it up on Medium. We are not at the stage where we're doing science. We're at the stage where we're documenting experiences. These are just anecdotes. They're individual experiences, and the point is that they are miraculous from my perspective. They are such outliers, they're so unexpected that I think there's something going on. 